Clint Eastwood is James Bond in the Iger Sanction. Which of course is not the case, but while it doesn't feel far off in this 1975 spy thriller where Clint Eastwood plays an assassin turned art professor uh, whose Blofeld-like albino boss forces him out of retirement to track down and kill a man who murdered his best friend. But this is no straightforward sanction. There's a bit of a drawback in that Clint has to perform the assassination whilst climbing the deadliest mountain in Europe, the Eiger, a mountain that he previously almost died on. Now, there's also loads more going on in this film. I can't wait to talk about it. Let's check it out. Now, the Iger Sanction isn't really that well regarded in Clint Eastwood's filmography. And maybe that's because the whole thing's just a little bit ludicrous with a serious plot regarding assassination and double crosses, awkwardly mixed with that mid 70s Bond style tongue in cheek comedy. A delivery? I have this box of dental flaws for Dr. Millar, but he doesn't answer his door. He's off today. What'll I do with this box of flaws? It's probably the reason it didn't go down well with audiences at the time, but definitely the reason that I love it. Let me explain. So, Clint Eastwood is forced onto one last job by a top secret organisation, which is headed by an albino ex-Nazi who runs all of his affairs from a darkened room and requires regular blood transfusions to stay alive, no, really. Uh, now there's absolutely no reason for any of this. It's got absolutely nothing to do with the plot and it's hilariously awkward uh, watching Clint Eastwood sat there arguing with this albino supervillain. You have to get somebody else to do your wet work. Please, that is a distasteful phrase. Call it what you want, wet work, termination, sanction. It all adds up to the same thing, killing. It is what you do best. You see, Eastwood plays Jonathan Hemlock, um, an art history professor who teaches a class filled with adoring young women. Um, one such student is obviously willing to do anything to achieve a passing grade. I mean, I'd, I'd be willing to do anything. Anything at all, really. Well, side note, despite playing 35 in this film, Eastwood was in fact 45 when the film was released. Ed, go on home. Break out the books and study your little ass off. That's the best way to maintain a B average. And so why would a man of such uh, steadfast morals be coaxed out of retirement? Um, well, the agency which hires him will report his priceless art collection to the IRS if he doesn't. And if he does the job, uh, they'll give him an IRS exemption letter. <laughs> Hi guys, I'm Stephen of Real Classic Film Reviews. If you are a Clint Eastwood fan, um, a fan of 70s spy thrillers, or just a fan of great old school cinema in general, then uh, please consider subscribing to the channel and uh, drop some review suggestions in the comments box below. Um, I'll give you a shout out if I review your choice. Now, let's get back to the Iger Sanction. Now, Clint's a bit out of practice in terms of scaling Killer Mountain, so he enlists the help of his old buddy George Kennedy to get him ready with a training program that shows off some absolutely stunning uh, Arizona photography and the absolutely stunning George who's tasked with helping him train by using some pretty unorthodox methods. But seriously one of the film's strengths lies in its jaw-dropping visuals. Uh, the Iger Sanction was in fact the last time that anyone was legally allowed to climb the totem pole in Arizona and wow uh, just check out some of these amazing pre-CGI of course, uh, shots of Eastwood high above the floor of Monument Valley. You're gonna stand up there all day admiring yourself? Or are you gonna bring me up? Now I won't waste too much time dwelling on uh, Clint Eastwood's running with a gay secret agent, Miles Mello, and his muscle beach henchman, uh, Dwayne. Suffice to say they're pretty much treated as buffoons uh, with a very mid-70s and thus very dated idea of what a gay agent might be like. I mean, he carries around a, a small Pomeranian dog called uh, Faggot. Oh. But as a positive, they do add to the colourful roster of characters. Right, I almost forgot, and well, you probably will too, about Clint's relationship with a stewardess named Jemima, played well to be fair by Vanita McGee. Again, she's a black female sidekick in a 70s action film, so she's obviously ultimately superfluous to the plot. So it's quite odd that a huge chunk of the film goes by before we finally get to Switzerland and lay our eyes on the Iger itself. And this is where, for me anyway, things start to unravel a little bit more. 
You see, the Eiger Sanction is great as a spy thriller that's a bit silly, uh, but once it finally decides to be a mountain climbing action movie, the cracks do begin to appear. Uh, you see, Clint has to figure out which of the three fellow climbers is his target, uh, something he will apparently only find out once he's about 6,000 feet up the dreaded north wall of the mountain. Surely there was an easier way. Regardless, I don't think the identity of the sanction is particularly important. Uh, what we're really here for is seeing Clint Eastwood dangling from the Alps and the film definitely delivers in that department. Now, I'm not a climber and don't claim to have any real knowledge about what is an incredible and incredibly dangerous activity, but I do think the Iger Sanction does a great job of showing us the intricacies and patience and dangers of climbing. Um, it's not a gung-ho, crazy action fest along the lines of something like Cliffhanger. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, I don't think the film is as interested in the secret agent slash assassination side of things, but more focused on the mountain itself and the process of climbing it. So in amongst all the boys' own adventuring, there was a tragic side to the production of the Iger Sanction, uh, when 26-year-old British climber David Knowles was killed when a rock fell on him, killing him instantly. Uh, surprisingly, and probably something that wouldn't happen today, uh, the production continued on. So the Iger Sanction had a bit of a bad reception upon its release in 1975, um, infamously leading to Eastwood's departure from Universal, the studio with which he produced his previous three films as director. Now, Clint wouldn't go back to Universal until 2008's Changeling, three decades later. So Clint Eastwood blamed Universal's marketing efforts for the Iger Sanction's failure, but I think he ultimately probably thought it was a better film than audiences did. Now, the Iger Sanction's a bit of a wobbly blend of spy thriller, spoof and extreme sports. Um, it maybe would have been more successful if it had just chosen to be one of those, uh, but then maybe it wouldn't have been as fun. Go check it out.